Hey everyone, I'm Brian Burnell with Burnell Retro and Vintage Collections, and to celebrate the 30th anniversary of James Bond Jr., here is my 2009 interview with James Bond Jr. himself, Corey Burton. Enjoy. Uh, the great voice actors that I, uh, I mean, as a very young child, and uh, from a very early age, uh, I, I loved funny voices and impersonations. My dad used to imitate uh, uh, family members and and friends, uh, and he'd get big laughs. And I thought, oh, you know, that's that's pretty cool. You can uh, entertain people with your voice, and uh, and there's some really remarkable characters uh, on TV and on the radio. And I think I can sound like that. It was really my favorite treat as a kid was to go to Disneyland. They were uh, going to open this new attraction, uh, which was a haunted mansion. I could not wait to see it. And when it finally opened and we visited, it was just the best thing I had ever experienced in my life. And then there was this voice, this voice I'd been hearing all my life. It was something so magical and and intriguing and different about it. It, it didn't seem like a real human being. I thought, well, it, it's got to be a person. I have to find out who this is, who has this incredible sound. And, of course, recognizing those vocal qualities in some of my favorite characters on uh, cartoons especially, I went about writing letters to radio stations that were running a commercial a Halloween commercial that had a similar sounding voice. I thought, aha, uh-huh, this is the guy. Uh, finally, I actually got a letter back from a radio station, a big radio station, that had the host who was the announcer from Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In, Gary Owens. And go, oh, yes, that's, that's the famous Paul Fries. <laughs> and the first assignment, uh, was uh, as uh, Ludwig von Drake, uh, which they had been searching for uh, even before he had passed away because he moved up far from Los Angeles uh, up north. So he wasn't very easy to to get to come in to record. So that was the first time that I had been assigned to work on a character that he had done. But I was always very intimidated because he was a genius. I had no idea of how I could replicate that kind of brilliance. It wasn't until decades later, uh, as I'd been working around the business for all those years, that this project came up uh, for a little tribute show to The Haunted Mansion and Nightmare Before Christmas. First, I really did not want to take on that awesome responsibility of that uh, incredible uh, character. But anyway, they wanted to record a little demo. Uh, because the voice had been ringing in my head for, uh, for all, you know, most of my life, uh, of course I've developed a lot of, um, a lot of technique and, and, and familiarity uh, with, uh, with subtle voice qualities to be able to mimic an awful lot of voices and uh, so I just did my best impression and with a lot of help from some marvelous sound engineering and a good script and just a good show all around we worked as a team to recreate this sound it's it's, it's an illusion if you actually listen to what I did side by side with the original, it really doesn't sound like it. But if it's not side by side, I guess I captured enough of 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 his qualities to trick the ear uh, and be able to communicate the the character that he did well enough that people actually think it it sounds exactly like him, which it. It doesn't, but it was a it, it was a great honor. Yeah, Daz Butler was my mentor. He was actually uh, the first voice actor I had met. I found out that coincidentally, my uncle knew June Foray, who is to this day 
the first and greatest character voice woman. So that afforded me the opportunity to uh, get in touch with her and call her up and chat and ask about this business I was interested in and hopefully get to meet these people. And she invited me to sit in on a recording session that she was doing. It was actually for a, a local television program that aired late night movies. Their recording, the character voices that went in between commercial breaks was Dawes Butler. And funny, because I had pictured him to be a tall, lanky, distinguished looking gentleman. Uh, I had this image of him uh, as sort of a uh, royal figure. <laughs> of course, he was royalty uh, as a voice actor. I didn't really know what to expect. But, uh, of course, uh, myself and a good friend of mine, uh, when we entered the studio, they said, oh, yeah, they're in there. <laughs> and here were the two tiniest <laughs> grown people I think I had ever met. Uh, Dawes was uh, a five foot two, imp a little impish looking man. Uh, some people say he looked like a leprechaun, who was instantly friendly and not just approachable, but he approached us and said, Ah, oh, so you guys interested in watching what we do? Oh, well, see, now here's uh, this, is a, this is a microphone that's going to be recording us. And, and he started to explain everything, ask questions. Every step of the way, when they were setting up the various shots, uh, he would be teaching. It just, it just was a natural part of his personality. He just loved sharing about the craft of voice acting. After meeting him there, I went with June to several other recording sessions and met a few other of my heroes. But I had always felt so comfortable and kept in touch with, uh, with Dawes Butler. After high school, uh, attending college for a while, uh, I got a call from Dawes Butler when I was working at uh, Radio Shack. And he said, uh, oh, you know, um, um, you're interested in this business and, uh, and uh, I think you could really use a workshop, and I just happened to be starting up a workshop. So, why don't you come? I know you sh you should really come because I, I was I was, and still am extremely shy. Just was pretty terrified of the prospect of you know uh, reading scripts uh, in front of him and strangers. Uh, but I knew I wanted to do this, and I wanted to learn, and. So I, I just did it. Now, I, I wasn't a real quick learner. Really, it took years of listening and experimenting in this workshop setting that when it finally just clicked, you just get to a point where you're able to feel the character in the words and it sort of jumps off the page and performs itself in a way. But I always like to point out that the writer is really the show. The writer is the characters. Uh, it, it comes from their mind, from their vision of a created reality. And the characters that populate that fantasy world, a uh, good writer is able to put that on the page... And it's our job to take those puzzle pieces of words and letters off of the page and bring it into the world <laughs> uh, as sound. In my visits with Dawes Butler, before, that was, this was actually before the workshop, he had me record for a while and do a, do a bunch of voices. He just wanted to sort of see what I had going on. And I don't know if he asked me or, or if I just came up with it. It's, oh, this is a, a, an impression that I've been doing for PA announcements in high school and where, whatever, just whenever I <laughs> would record little bits, uh, I found it easy to impersonate this character actor, Hans Conried, who was snidely whiplash on the cartoon uh, Dudley Do-Right, the Rocky and Bullwinkle series. I found it 
really easy to sound like him. It was just something, something about the tone of his voice that I was able to replicate by simply shifting my tone. <laughs> just, just changing vocal placement and imagining the man himself. <laughs> uh, he had a rather sizable schnozola and uh, high cheekbones. Yeah, it's funny. I I know I've 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 heard in uh, in interviews that he did later in life when he was asked about his accent. He said, uh, he said uh, "Well, I don't have any specific accent, but I grew up in New York, so uh, I I I took on this uh, this actor's accent, and I, I I let's just call it affected." <laughs> I think the trick in being convincing at an accent is to underplay it. Um, to just, you know, just a bit, just a tiny, just just little hints, certain, as they say, diphthongs, you know, the, the vowel sounds uh, instead of uh, O, as we say, uh, you know, it becomes O. You know, it's just a slight difference, and 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 I becomes I, you know, just a little bit more in the nose, and she's just a little coloration, and I think that's that's the trick to doing really convincing dialects is to yeah keep it very subtle, you know, like if I were to, you know, do like Russian accents. You do just just a little bit, so that there's 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 just this uh, this hint of of Russian. It's not, you know, that is not this kind of exaggerated thing that you know. Uh, you don't hear people talk that way. It doesn't sound real. <laughs> uh, it sounds like a cartoon, you know. Now for. For cartoon characterization, sometimes we do exaggerate the accents. Well, the very first job I had as a professional was for uh, a division of Disney. It was for uh, a division that doesn't, I don't think, well, it doesn't exist in that form anymore. It hasn't in a long time called uh, Wademco, uh, which was Walt Disney Educational Media Company. And they made little films uh, and and these slide films that I had that we had <laughs> growing up uh for schools and that was also the connection with with Dawes Butler was he was doing this slide film for uh, for Wademco they were looking for a character that sounded like Hans Conried and Hans Conried was out of town he was on tour doing uh, uh, a play, a musical, uh, so he couldn't make it in for the session. And Dawes Butler uh, called me up and said, uh, oh, you know, they, they want a Hans Conried voice. You want to audition for this? And, well, that was scary, but, uh, but yeah, I thought, well, why not? And that turned into my first professional job. Yeah, I auditioned for uh, the role of Professor Plumbutter. In Chef Amalette's health diet, <laughs> and uh, had my first professional session with Dawes Butler and Don Messick, and Janet Waldo, and Hal Smith. It was unbelievable, and of course, and here were all of these, all of these wonderful little tiny people <laughs> uh, who were just as friendly as could be, and and they, they sure sure helped me through it as I was scared to death unless I have a a good feeling that I can that I can deliver the essential uh, soul of that character and come close enough to their sound you know to to be worth hiring <laughs> you know uh, you'll get a sample of of the original voice and and listen and and walk around with it uh, uh, try a, a bit of dialogue that they either they want or 
if if I've just been assigned a voice and they don't have a script ready yet, then I will transcribe um, something from a, a, a sample recording that I've got. And then, you know, listen and listen and then try it out on my own, maybe record it on my own and listen again, you know, talk along with the recording, sort of echo it until it snaps into focus. It's like, okay, yeah, good, good. I think that'll work. I think that sounds that sounds close enough or the or I'm getting I'm getting the right quality uh where people will recognize it as that character. See, I've always been a mimic, just a natural mimic. Uh, there's actually a word for it that has <laughs> that's part of it is parrot <laughs> but i don't, I, uh, I forgot it's maybe some kind of latin thing uh but uh, yeah i've just i've just always had a had a knack for hearing a voice and you know it tickles my ear and it's like oh i can sound like that <laughs> you know uh, well when i was a little kid uh, especially i remember i think the first thing the first voice i ever tried was uh, I was watching the Flintstones and Mel Blanc did this parrot, you know. Flintstones are cheapskate, you know, or Jetsons are cheapskate. That was from the Jetsons anyway. Uh, and uh, I thought, oh, I can do that. And, you know, and I would, <laughs> with my little recorders. Uh, and, yeah, and you just, you're sort of born with a mimic's ear, I guess. So, yeah, I start with those sort of mechanical skills of mimicry. Um, when learning a character voice. But then there comes a point where you have to throw out that mechanical part of the process where you're, you're consciously manipulating the sound of your voice and the way you shape words. You have, to, you have to forget about that. Now that you know how the character feels, then you apply the feeling of that character to the material that you're presented, then that's where this mysterious, magical part of the process takes over, and the character sort of just jumps off the page. You you look at the words on the page, you hear what that sounds like in your head, and then let what you hear in your head just pour out of your face. <laughs> An original characterization is the hardest thing for me because I'm sort of on autopilot with something that's an impression or an imitation. You know, where do you start? You, you, you try to get a feeling from, especially if it's an animated character, from, from the, the sketch, from the look of the character, uh, the description that they give you, and the words themselves. And then sometimes it's a process of trying out various vocal placements, various accents, uh, until something just starts to work with those lines, like especially if it's uh, supposed to be funny, if something that is especially amusing. And you just keep zeroing in until something feels right. It's all from a character standpoint, you know. Uh, I become a narrator character or a movie trailer guy, you know. Uh, of course, uh, the most popular uh, movie trailer announcer was uh, the, the recently late, great Don LaFontaine. And he has this very coarse texture to the voice. Uh, most most movie trailers do. They just uh, movie studios. They they just love that that ragged, deep, <laughs> intimate sound because it's very arresting to the ear. So it really gets people to pay attention. And there's also there's a, there's another great uh, movie trailer uh, announcer narrator named uh, Hal Douglas, who I, I think was probably a radio actor. He's, he's a, an elderly character actor. And so I sort of base a characterization on, on those voices. And also, too, an awful lot of what I do uh, as an announcer is nostalgic 
retro styles. So I do impersonations, basically, of the trailer voices I grew up with, you know, like for the Grindhouse campaign, Planet Terror. Now, when I was uh, a teenager, uh, the voice of, of movie trailers was a guy named Adolf Caesar. But yeah, he had this really rough voice, and he, uh, he did this kind of macho character. He and a lot of people that also did the same style uh, used to do all of the the B movie trailers, you know. My main advice when tell people who are interested in doing this for a living, first of all, do you love it more than anything else in life? Because to get good at it and to make a career of it, there will be trade offs in life, major trade offs. Your time is not your own anymore, being in show business uh, and this part of show business. Uh, you've got to love it enough to do a lot of very scary things, uh, especially if you're a shy person, which most performers are. You've, you've got to get yourself out there in public and, well, in professional circumstances, present yourself well. You've got to be able to perform under fire, under pressure. There is so much to learn. There's uh, so much to refine. You have to be constantly absorbing uh, voices and words and ideas to incorporate into your work the demands of the business and of even just learning the craft sure take you know a, a huge percentage of your time and energy uh, if you don't love it that much uh, you know the rejection that is constant in show business uh, and the difficulties in getting work and getting established are so great that if you've got anything else in life that would be easier, you'll usually drop out. You usually give up along the way. It has to be an imperative in your life. And then, you know, I'm going to do this no matter what. I mean, my goal was, uh, you know, I said to myself as a teenager, well, I'm going to be a professional voice actor or I'm going to die trying. <laughs> the odds are so much against a new talent coming into the business and and becoming a part of the, the voice acting pool uh, enough to make a living at it. You know, the, the odds are so rough that, uh, you know, it, it's sometimes... Uh, uh, <laughs> well, would seem to be the worst decision in the world. <laughs> but still, there is always, with perseverance and dedication, I do believe that, that anybody with enough of those qualities, and of course you have to be, have a little bit of natural talent to begin with, but eventually you will make it. It may take years and years, but... You know, the more you chip away at it, the better you get at it, the more you get established and known, and sooner or later you start to pick up enough work and your name spreads around, uh, you get a good agent, and start to build a career, one, one audition, one job after another. They start to trickle in at first, and then it's sort of... It sort of spreads out in network fashion, uh, a reputation or a connection base through an agent or other friends in the business, and you get more and more offers until a point where you're getting more auditions in a day than you have time to do. <laughs> you really gotta love it. 